Hi, everyone. Um, thanks a lot for, uh, again, inviting me to, uh, to talk here. Um, so um, we're going to continue. I'm going to talk about mitochondrial dysfunction and autism and some of the unique abnormalities and, and some uh, basics of how we uh, <clears throat> um, look at treatment. I'm from Phoenix. This is not Phoenix. Um, so just disclosures of some of our funding. Again, you know, I like to uh, uh, say, you know, all the treatments that we talk about are not FDA approved or approved by regulatory agencies. So it's important for um, any treatment that you consider on your child to um, have a, a physician that's knowledgeable in these treatments. So the mitochondria. Uh, we're finding the mitochondria is extremely important in, uh, in autism. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the mitochondria is uh, what we call the powerhouse of the cell, and you can see it right here. Um, it's a very complex, what we call organelle, small organ inside the cell. And uh, cells in your body don't just have one mitochondria, they have anywhere from hundreds to tens of thousands of mitochondria, depending on their energy needs. So, uh, for instance, skin cells may have 100 because they don't need all that much energy, whereas muscle cells may have tens of thousands of mitochondria. The mitochondria is extremely complex. It has two membranes, this outer membrane and then this inner membrane that has all these folds. And the folds um, is what we call it the cristae. Um, and that's where the kind of magic happens where you make ATP, which is the energy molecule. Um, but inside this inner membrane is what we call the matrix. Um, and inside the matrix, the mitochondria has its own DNA. And in fact, doesn't have only <clears throat> just one copy of DNA. It has several copies of uh, uh, DNA, and they may or may not all be the same. Um, and because of that, because it has its own DNA, it's the only other part of the cell that has DNA besides the nucleus. Um, it also has to have the machinery to turn this code, this DNA code, into the proteins that it needs to function. However, um, most of the genes that control the mitochondria are in the nucleus of the cell. They're not in the mitochondria. But it makes for very complex inheritance um, because of the fact that you have two sets of DNA um, or genetic programs that control the mitochondria. So mitochondria disease and um, the mitochondria itself, you know, is uh, something that, you know, is something relatively new in medicine. Really the first mitochondrial diseases um, were um, first described in 1988. So it's a little over um, 30 years ago. Um, and in medicine, that's kind of a blink of the eye. At the same year, there was two papers published in Nature and Science describing the first mitochondrial diseases. For the most part, since mitochondria, you know, are important for making energy, the symptoms that you get with mitochondrial disease are those in the parts of the body that uh, require high energy, and that is the nervous system, <clears throat> the GI system, and the immune system. And if you think about everything we've been talking about in uh, these uh, sessions, you know, these three right here are um, extreme, exactly what we find to be dysfunctional in kiddos with autism. And of course, we think it's the powerhouse of the cell, but it's also involved in many other aspects of the cell. It's kind of the center of metabolism. Um, so it's very important for many other things. Where do you find mitochondrial disease or problems with the mitochondria? Well, the more and more we look, the more and more we're finding it. Of course, you know, in, in, in autism and learning disabilities, but also in diabetes and epilepsy um, and GI motility disorders and immune disorders and, and neurodegenerative or neuroimmune disorders such as multiple sclerosis, um, unexplained things like unexplained liver failure, blind, blindness or kidney disease or heart failure. Uh, so it seems to be involved many times in many diseases, a lot of diseases, a lot of the ones that we're really not sure of the origin. Now the connection between mitochondrial disease and dysfunction and autism really actually isn't new. Um, it uh, really, the first report was in 1985, before we even had mitochondrial disease described uh, by Mary Coleman and my alma mater, Georgetown. Uh, she actually noticed that about 5% of kids with autism had lactic acidemia, um, which is a, a sign that the mitochondria isn't working, and proposed that there was some problem 
with carbohydrate metabolism. Um, so, as uh, you know, um, as I started to get interested in uh, in autism and try and figure out um, what the origins of it were, um, I heard that uh, you know that uh, that um, mitochondrial disorders may be associated with autism. So, um, you know, what scientists do, and my, what myself and Dr. Rosignol did, is we did something called um, a systematic literature review and meta-analysis. And what that means is you kind of go through the literature to actually see, you know, what the evidence is for any particular disorder or connection between disorder. And um, through this uh, review and meta-analysis, we found some very interesting findings. You know, first of all, we found that uh, out of the three papers that looked at very um, uh, at mitochondrial disease, which is a very particular diagnosis, that uh, they came up with the figure that 5% of kids with autism have mitochondrial disease. Um, and um, and that's, uh, um, that's uh, really a gigantic number for mitochondrial disease because mitochondrial disease in general is considered extremely rare. Um, in the uh, normal population. So 5% um, is a large number in any, you know, um, associated with any disease. But what we also found is when we looked at markers of mitochondrial dysfunction, so blood markers that were telling us the mitochondria wasn't working right, we found that report showed that, uh, that there's much higher than this 5%, that 31% had elevated lactate, 14% um, about had elevated pyruvate, and the uh, lactate to pyruvate ratio was elevated in, um, um, in a, almost 30%. Um, elevation in alanine, which is another uh, marker, was elevated um, in um, about 8%. And then low carnitine, which is important in about uh, 90%. So, um, uh, so it seemed like there was uh, these markers of mitochondrial dysfunction, that the mitochondria wasn't working right, um, was much higher than this 5% for mitochondrial disease suggesting maybe this, uh, what we define as mitochondrial disease, which is a kind of little box that we put things in um, with a very particular diagnosis, wasn't really capturing um, the uh, number of kids where the mitochondria was not working. Um, and then, let me just, yeah. And then uh, this paper came along um, from the MIND Institute at UC Davis, uh, where they looked at lymphocytes, so uh, immune cells, of 10 kids with autism and 10 age match controls. And when they looked at the actual enzymes in the mitochondria, that is the machinery to see if it was working right, they found that 80%, so eight out of the 10 children that they looked at had abnormal function um, in at least one of the enzymes that they looked at um, in the mitochondria, suggesting that uh, this number was much higher um, than, uh, than five or even 30%. So one of the other things uh, that we did is we looked at kiddos that were diagnosed with mitochondrial disease, specifically in autism, and compared them to uh, kiddos in the general ASD population and kiddos with mitochondrial disease without autism to see if there is any particular symptoms or signs that really made these kids stand out. And we found something interesting. We found that uh, that uh, there was a higher rate of neurodevelopmental regression in those with mitochondrial disease um, at about 50%. But of course, this shows you how complex this is, that we also found there was a higher rate of motor delays at, uh, at 50%. So uh, this uh, suggests, um, one, that motor delays, which we don't see in a lot of kids with autism, um, uh, is a red flag for mitochondrial disease and autism, but it also shows you how different it can be, that some kids with mitochondrial disease have problems from early on, and others show regression. That is, they develop um, almost normally and then uh, lose skills. There's a higher rate of seizures and GI ab eye abnormalities, up to 74% of kids with mitochondrial disease and autism had GI abnormalities, and, and this is um, uh, consistent with what we see, I get a lot of kids referred to me from the GI clinic um, who have, have very bad GI disease, and they say, well, maybe there's some type of mitochondrial problem underlying that. And down here, which you can't quite see, is we looked at how many of these kiddos 
had actually genetic abnormalities to explain their mitochondrial disease because it's thought really mitochondrial disease is more of a genetic disorder. Um, and uh, I don't think you can see it, but it's about 23%. Um, and, and this was mitochondrial DNA abnormalities. There was only, I think, two cases with nuclear abnormalities. So I want to get about a quarter of the kids um, with strictly defined mitochondrial disease actually had a genetic abnormality to explain it, suggesting that maybe something else was going on, um, that these, this wasn't purely a simple genetic disorder. And then this paper came along, which is uh, really kind of very interesting, um, and told us about how different mitochondrial dysfunction can be in kiddos with autism um, versus those with mitochondrial disease. And uh, this was a uh, case report of a girl um, that, uh, that had something called Lay syndrome, which is a uh, mitochondrial disease. And she's right here. Um, and she had all the characteristics of, of Lay syndrome, including an abnormal MRI. Um, and it was caused by a mutation in the mitochondrial DNA. But uh, mitochondrial DNA, um, again, as I had kind of described is you don't just have one copy of your mitochondrial DNA, you have hundreds of copies. Um, so what can happen is that sometimes you can have an error on some copies and others can be fine. And this is called heteroplasmy. So they measured that and they found that this girl with Lay syndrome that about 80% of her mitochondrial DNA had this, uh, uh, this, uh, this genetic disorder. But she had a brother and the brother didn't have Lay syndrome, the, the, uh, the brother had autism. Um, and he had a, uh, kind of a less load of this genetic abnormality at about 60%. But what was very interesting is the girl with Lay syndrome, um, as we classically find in mitochondrial disease, um, her complexes, the machinery in her mitochondria were, was decreased. It was functioning very poorly, below 20% of normal. But the boy had the opposite. Actually, his complex one was through the roof. It was very, very, very high, which is unusual and not typical um, of uh, mitochondrial disease. Um, and then um, one of the other things that was, uh, so that, there's that report. And then when I started to see kiddos with, um, with autism that I suspected might have mitochondrial disease, one of the things that we do is something called a muscle biopsy. And a muscle biopsy, um, you can actually measure these complexes of the machinery in the mitochondria um, with a lot of accuracy. And what I started finding, and this was a case report, our first case report um, of five kiddos, is that when we measured um, these complexes, instead of them functioning very poorly, which would be down here at about 20%, we found that complex four, one of the important enzymes in the, uh, in the mitochondria was functioning at 200% of normal. So it was kind of overactive uh, for some reason. So, and, and these kids appeared if they had mitochondrial disease. So it seemed like this was a new uh, type of um, uh, syndrome um, of mitochondrial dysfunction. And it ended up, um, when, you look at, when I looked in the literature, I wasn't the only one that found this. This is a study where they uh, looked at human uh, brain tissue from those with um, ASD and controls, and they actually found that there was a significant increase in complex four also in the brain tissue of individuals with autism. Of course, we wanted to look at this in kind of a, a large number of kiddos, and you can't do muscle biopsies on a large number of kiddos with autism, nor can you get brain tissue. So we were able to use something called the buccal swab technique, where we swab the inside of the cheek, and we measure how the, uh, the mitochondria is functioning um, by, um, <clears throat> by that, uh, that method. And you can do this on a lot of kiddos. And we do this routinely in our clinic to try and find out if there is mitochondrial disease that would be present. And here we have um, the, uh, the graphs of um, the kiddos that we saw. The black ones are within normal limits and the red ones are outside the normal limits. And we have something called citrate synthase, which kind of tells us about mitochondrial proliferation, complex one and complex four. And what we found is that there was a lot of kids with very low mitochondrial function, but there's also a lot of kids with very high mitochondrial function. 
particularly complex one and complex four, uh, suggesting that there is this subset where instead of the, the mitochondria working very poorly, it's working very, 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 um, um, very fast and, and, and somewhat overactive. And so this is a, a diagram not, uh, th that's been made uh, um, that, uh, that kind of describes how we might be seeing this, that in autism spectrum disorder, you may have this overlap with possible, probable, or definite mitochondrial disease, um, the way we see these overlaps, where as there might be a much larger number that have non-classic mitochondrial disease, or as we call it, mitochondrial dysfunction. So we we're trying to figure out, well, where might this mitochondrial dysfunction be coming from? Um, and one thing we know is that lots of kids with um, autism seem to also have high levels of oxidative stress. And oxidative stress uh, can cause dysfunction of the mitochondria within itself. Um, and that's uh, for a number of reasons. You know, um, and uh, that's uh, the, the mitochondria is very sensitive to oxidative stress and needs to have its own antioxidant system. Um, when you have lots of oxidative stress, it can be harmful to mitochondrial proteins, cause mitochondrial mutation, um, cause uh, inflammation by cytokine production, which also causes mitochondrial issues, decrease um, um, ATP uh, synthase. Um, and there's actually reasons for this. It's not just kind of theoretical. If you actually look at the antioxidant system in the mitochondria, you know that the mitochondria um, requires to control oxidative stress glutathione, the major antioxidant of our body. But in order to make glutathione, um, you have to use ATP. And ATP is this energy molecule that the mitochondria makes. So if the mitochondria isn't making energy, you're not gonna make glutathione. And if you don't make glutathione, the mitochondria is not gonna function well because you're not gonna control oxidative stress. And it can very well be because of kind of uh, this may be an example of where you may have some type of genetic predisposition and you have environmental effects um, come together to actually cause a perfect storm and start this vicious cycle of mitochondrial dysfunction. So um, uh, we, uh, we asked, uh, of course, you know, um, what is the evidence for this? Um, and how can we look at this in more detail? So one of the things we did is we said, well, we got these uh, mitochondria that um, are functioning, it seems like in patients, that some of the patients have mitochondria that are functioning you know, um, at high levels or are overactive. Um, how else can we look at this? And this is one of several studies where we use lymphoblastoid cell lines. Those are cell lines that are kept in a biobank that have been collected years before from kiddos with autism. And we said, well, if we look at these cell lines, do they also have mitochondrial dysfunction? Um, and in several studies, this is just one of them, we showed that, uh, that, in, in, that indeed they do. And this is just one of the parameters that we measure called reserve capacity. And we could see that the kids with autism at baseline here have much higher reserve capacity than either um, sibling controls, so typically developing siblings, or non-related controls, which is down here. And then what we did is we said, well, you know, theoretically, you know, mitochondria are sensitive to oxidative stress. Are these uh, cells more sensitive to oxidative stress um, uh, than, um, than, uh, than, uh, than typically developing individuals? And indeed they are. We looked at this important parameter called reserve capacity, which tells us how much reserve the uh, mitochondria has in case it gets stressed. So in case it really, um, there's some physiological stress that happens, um, what does the mitochondria do? How can it be resilient? And what we found is as we stress the cells, which is down here, we use something called DMNQ to stress the cells. We found that this reserve capacity started to fall much faster in these overactive mitochondria than in control mitochondria, suggesting that this overactivity has a, um, a consequence. It makes the cells much more sensitive um, to physiological stresses. Um, one of the other questions, of course, is, is this linked to behavior? And so what we were able to do is divide up the uh, cell lines that we got from this biobank 
and to those that had high amounts of repetitive behavior and low amounts of repetitive behavior. And indeed, we found that the ones that, uh, the kiddos that had high amounts of repetitive behaviors, more severe beha repetitive behaviors, had the more severe mitochondrial profile. And so you have to remember, these, this was measured um, using the ADOS many years before these cells were collected and these cells were put into a biobank and then uh, reanimated. Um, and we actually see this uh, physiological defect. Of course, those are cell lines. So you ask, well, what about um, kiddos with autism? What do they look at like? And so we did a study where we measured mitochondrial function in um, PBMCs, which are peripheral blood mononuclear cells or immune cells from kids with autism. And uh, we looked at this profile of reserve capacity again, of both what it was at baseline to see if it would be elevated and how sensitive it was, which is here. And we use something called cluster analysis to see if we can get a cluster that differed from the rest. And in fact, we did. We found out that about a quarter to a third of the kiddos with autism had this profile where their reserve capacity was elevated. That is, their mitochondria were working um, 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 over time, and they were sensitive to oxidative stress. And we actually looked at controls to see how they overlapped, and we can see that the controls did not overlap with this one group. We also, um, again, we thought, well, maybe this is a new type of mitochondrial dysfunction that is separate from what we define as mitochondrial disease. So then we got kids with mitochondrial disease and graphed them. And you can see that there are a distinct group from the kiddos with this kind of unique type of mitochondrial dysfunction in autism, suggesting this might be a unique you know, mitochondrial abnormality. Um, so um, one of the things that we, you know, hypothesize is, well, if um, these kids, uh, if their mitochondria are sensitive to physiological stresses, um, maybe these are kids that are uh, sensitive to certain types of environmental triggers like you see in regressive type autism. We think usually there's some type of trigger. So in this study we did with Andy Zimmerman um, at uh, UMass, um, we uh, took cells um, that he collected from a cohort of kids with autism and divided them up into those with developmental regression and no developmental regression. And what we found again, this is a seahorse profile, but you can see here where we look at the maximal um, uh, respiratory capacity that the kids with, with developmental regression, their cells had this same phenotype of overactive mitochondria. Um, we've done other studies where we've looked at fibroblasts um, from kiddos with autism, um, and we were able to divide them up into those with um, uh, um, overactivity of the, uh, of the mitochondria and those with uh, normal activity. And, uh, and what we found is that those with overactive um, mitochondria, actually their mitochondria look differently. And we can see here, these are the ones that are with the cells with overactive mitochondria, that what uh, we can see is they're bunched up more near the nucleus of the cell, and they make these networks. So they're bunched up in networks and connected. You can see here, whereas those with more normally functioning mitochondria have these very long, thin mitochondria networks that are distributed throughout the cell. So, you know, one of our hypotheses was that, well, what's happening is you get some type of uh, chronic insult and some time, some, for some reason, you have this kind of maladaptive behavior of the mitochondria, which makes um, some type of just mild acute oxidative insult cause really severe abnormalities. So, uh, so really, they're very sensitive to these environmental um, 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 issues. And so the question is, how do you, um, you know, how do you look at that? And so um, we decided to first focus on prenatal factors. The idea that you may start out with healthy mitochondria, but prenatally, between a combination of genetics, nutrients, maybe toxins, um, disturbance of the microbiome, infections, medications, other causes of oxidative stress and inflammation, you can get stressed mitochondria. And then at some point, you may have, you know, some other type of stress after birth, oxidative stress or immune activation, which causes your mitochondria to become frankly dysfunctional, causes 
um, problems with neuronal dysfunction and abnormal brain development. So um, how do you actually look at that? So what we did is we looked at prenatal environmental um, influences. And the two things we looked at was air pollution exposure um, uh, be, uh, during the prenatal period. And we also looked at both uh, nutritional and toxic metals um, by examining baby teeth. So with a group at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, they can actually take baby teeth because baby teeth start to develop at the end of the first trimester. And so they incorporate everything the baby is actually exposed to. And so they can actually take this laser um, and go through the teeth as if they're like rings of a tree um, and tell you what the child was exposed to in utero. Um, and we divided these kiddos up into those with neurodevelopmental regression, so normal development, and then at some point um, they lose regression. Of course, we hypothesize that these were the kids with this, these mitochondria that increased respiration. Um, and then um, those with early onset or this developmental plateau, which may have decreased or, or normal mitochondrial respiration. So uh, what we found um, is that, um, that, that um, if you look at the concentration of PM25, which is a measure of air pollution prenatally, that uh, those with neurodevelopmental regression, the higher the uh, exposure, the more overactive their mitochondria are long-term. So this is measured when they're children. So this isn't just an effect that happens just acutely. This is something that continues long-term. Um, and we had uh, quite uh, good regression coefficients, a significant at 0.001 level. Um, and the opposite for those that had, um, uh, uh, did not have regression, that actually more um, exposure, exposure to higher levels of um, air pollution, you actually had um, a depression in mitochondrial function. So it shows you how you know, different types of toxins could actually aff affect different kiddos differently. And so this one, this I showed you is on something called ATP link respiration, which is one of the measures, um, and proton leak respiration. But we saw that pretty much on all of our measures of, um, of mitochondrial respiration that we measure in the, the assay that we do. Um, and in both when we looked at average concentration of PM25 and maximal concentration of PM25. One of the things we were able to do is we used kind of sophisticated analysis called um, uh, structured equation modeling uh, to ask how all these things interrelate. That is, we know that PM25 seems to um, be a risk factor for um, autism. There's, there's uh, many studies now that show that prenatal exposure to air pollution um, causes um, um, uh, or is related to autism. Uh, we show that it seemed to be related through the mitochondria somewhat. Uh, so we asked, well, how much of it, how much of the development or the behavior of the child is related directly to the exposure to air pollution? How much of that is, is, um, is caused by the effect of air pollution on the mitochondria? And what are the other factors such as oxidative stress um, which we know also seems to affect development, how much does that affect? And so this is in kids with, um, with uh, neurodevelopmental regression. What we found is that if you measure neurodevelopment using the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale, that it's about a third, a third, and a third, that about a third of the variation in neurodevelopment is accounted for by, directly by prenatal um, um, air pollution. About a third of it is because of the effect on, of the mitochondria, and about a third of it has to be due to abnormalities in redox metabolism. And you know what we find very exciting is these two here, so over 50% of this variation in neurodevelopment are in parts of the body that you might be able to treat. And similarly, these are for kids that did not have neurodevelopmental regression. We see uh, similar numbers. Interestingly, we did not find that these physiological factors of oxidative stress or mitochondrial function had a direct effect on behavior, but that the effect it had on behavior was of that on general neurodevelopment. And that the neurodevelopment itself, 
accounted for 60% of the variation of the autism symptoms and, uh, um, and uh, aberrant behavior, suggesting that just by improving neurodevelopment, you can improve some of these important symptoms. So again, we also looked at um, um, exposure to, um, uh, to uh, certain types of toxin and nutritional metals. And this was driven by this really nice study um, by uh, the, the group um, at Mount Science School of Medicine led by Manish Arona. Um, and um, what, uh, what they showed is when they looked at baby teeth in, tw in uh, twins, they actually found out where the kiddo that um, had autism, if you have a twin that had autism, which is in the red line, that you can see that, that both manganese and zinc are lower prenatally compared to the other twin. Um, and, the, and then postnatally, um, lead seemed to affect uh, a real risk factor for autism. Um, they also have other papers where they found that zinc and, and its relation to copper, which we know those are two very, very closely related um, compounds, that actually how they're related, the, the way that they cycle on and off during prenatal development is very important and is a risk factor for autism. So um, the, these, of course, implicate these nutritional metals um, um, in autism, but it of course, the question, what's the mechanism? So we looked at these nutritional metals, manganese, uh, magnesium, copper, zinc, and also some toxic metals, um, and asked if they were related to mitochondrial dysfunction. And we actually found out that in kids with neurodevelopmental regression, that there was a very high correlation between their long-term mitochondrial function and the prenatal levels of zinc and manganese. So their exposure prenatally. Um, and these are just more mitochondrial measurements. And then the other thing we found that was interesting, we also had, of course, kind of behavioral measures on these kiddos, uh, that we found that language development long-term was proportional to um, their exposure to copper and the copper-zinc ratio. Um, and of course, you know, why is this? We don't know, but one of the things we suspect is this has to do with, again, control of oxidative stress because zinc, copper, manganese are all very important with something called superoxide dismutase, which is a enzyme that's both in the mitochondria and the cytoplasm um, that, uh, that uses these nutritional metals and controls oxidative stress. And so um, this is just from one of our review papers um, where we talk about how if you look at many of the factors that are associated, genetic factors, um, environmental factors, and nutritional factors that um, are associated both positive and negatively with autism, they're also all, there's evidence that they affect the mitochondria prenatally. So this, uh, these prenatal exposures and the effect of prenatal exposures very much could be uh, functioning through the mitochondria. So what can we do about this? You know, so there's a somewhat of a controversy in mitochondrial medicine. Um, if you don't have frank mitochondrial disease, you know, do you treat it? A lot of times, you know, and they say really you need to have a diagnosis of mitochondrial disease or primary mitochondrial disease to actually treat it. And in this paper, um, uh, with D Dmitry Nazioff, um, we, uh, we actually argue that that's probably a little misguided and that even if it's a secondary mitochondrial dysfunction, you know, and even if you don't know, you should probably treat it. And we give examples in this paper of disorders that are clearly uh, secondary mitochondrial dysfunction, things like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, where because of the inflammation, um, you actually get mitochondrial dysfunction, and many of those kids respond to mitochondrial supplements, even though clearly mitochondrial disease, it's not primarily a mitochondrial disease. Um, usually you use a, a whole host of B vitamins and other types of supports like CoQ10 um, and uh, uh, antioxidants um, and, uh, and support for redox metabolism and also central folate um, support. What's the evidence for this in autism? 
You know, we always like to have evidence before we use any type of treatments. Um, there's not a lot, but there's some that we can look at. And I would look at this um, uh, study by Jim Adams. He has a couple of studies where he's put together this mineral vitamin supplement that, uh, that really supports mitochondrial function. And these kids didn't have mitochondrial disease, particularly, they're just kids with autism. And he showed that just a simple vitamin mineral supplement, which is pretty well tolerated, uh, significantly improves, you know, compared to placebo, this is a placebo control study, um, improves hyperactivity, um, tantruming, receptive language, and overall functioning. Another supplement that we use in treatment of mitochondrial uh, dis disease and dysfunction is uh, carnitine. And this is a double blind placebo control study that showed just giving carnitine to kids with autism improves um, the CAR scores, the CGI score, and the cognitive um, subset of the ATEC. And that, the, um, that some of these improvements were actually proportional to, um, to, the, uh, to how much you improve serum levels of carnitine in the blood. And this is a second study from Egypt where they used carnitine, a mi mitochondrial supplement, and show that it improved CAR scores in a double-blind placebo control study in autism. Um, we looked at, um, through our clinic, just kind of a naturalistic study, looked at kids that were on and off certain supplements, and we had measured their mitochondrial function, um, and we found that certain things popped out. So for, um, for complex one activity, we found that fatty acids and folate seem to improve it. Um, for uh, citrate synthase, uh, we found that fatty acids, folates, and antioxidants seem to um, improve its function. And then one of the things that we did, because many people look at these things as, as their absolute more or less, you know, um, is the important thing. We actually looked at how these different parts of the mitochondria are working together. So we showed that, um, that the uh, correlation between activity of complex one and complex four was better if you were on folate than if you weren't, suggesting that these parts of the mitochondria are working together better on certain supplements. And for the, the correlation between complex one and citrate synthase, folate and B12 seem to improve um, their correlation. Of course, the ultimate study would be to get kids that have mitochondrial dysfunction and autism and treat them specifically. And so the only study that's done that to date really was this uh, study by uh, Dr. Goldenthal uh, and Ladino um, when uh, at, um, uh, uh, I'd say in Christopher's Hospital uh, for Children in Philadelphia. And uh, Dr. Goldenthal is the one that developed this buccal swab test to measure mitochondrial function. And he was able to select kids that had mitochondrial dysfunction using this biomarker he has of complex one to complex four activity ratio. Um, and he showed that a very simple supplement of carnitine, CoQ10, and alpha-lipoic acid um, improved mitochondrial function and also um, improved um, behavior, um, including um, lethar lethargy or social withdrawal on the ABC and inappropriate speech. Um, and that when, then what he did is he took them off the supplement and showed that these things got worse. There's an open label study. So of course, the next step is a double blind placebo control study, which we're um, doing at this time. Other treatments, um, uh, this is a nice paper by Martha Herbert and Julie Buckley, where they had a kid with autism, refractory epilepsy um, and autism. And you can see the EEG here has these spikes in it that are continuing. This is what the kid looked like before time on two anti-epileptic medications. And they put the kid on a gluten-free, casein-free ketogenic diet and the EEG normalized. Ketogenic diet um, and the modified Atkins diet can be somewhat helpful, we find in epilepsy, um, autism and mitochondrial dysfunction, um, but it's, it's not that easy. This is a, a little meta-analysis I did of the four studies that has looked at the use of um, either the ketogenic diet or the modified Atkins diet. Um, and we can see that out of the parents that were educated in the diet, about 61% of them started it. So, you know, about two thirds started it, about two thirds were kind of scared off. Then of that, um, there was only about two thirds that could comply with the diet. So it's not an easy diet to comply with. 
but of those that, um, that, um, that started the diet, there was only 8% that didn't do well. So most did well, and about 58% of them showed moderate to significant improvement. And so the mitochondria is a complicated system. It can be um, affected by many environmental factors. And if it's not working, it can cause many different symptoms between, besides oxidative stress and inflammation. We also see autoimmunity, immunodeficiencies, neuronal dysfunction, problems with neuroplasticity, cerebral folate dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, and GI issues. And this is just a summary of some of the abnormalities that have been seen um, in the mitochondria um, and estimated between 30 and 80% of kids with autism can be associated with genetic abnormalities. There's biomarkers that we can measure. Um, there's certain types of treatments that you can use um, and, um, and there's certain reported clinical symptoms that could be red flags, including developmental delays, regression, sudden loss of skills, seizures, ataxia, muscle weakness, peripheral neuropathy, fatigue, and lethargy. So not, you know, not um, decreased activity, but many times fatigue after, you know, strenuous activity, gastrointestinal symptoms, endocrine abnormalities, problems growing, and gross motor delays. So with that, I'll thank you uh, for your attention. Do we have time for questions? Any questions from the public? Uh, uh, can we confirm mitochondrial disease? If we do meet the swab test, um, or it must be muscle biopsy. This is in case that genetic tests are in order. Yeah, I mean, usually um, my, uh, my sequence is to uh, do the mito swab, you know, um, to see uh, what, where, uh, where we are. And, uh, and a lot of times I'll, I'll do um, also, um, I'll, I do whole genome sequencing. So now, uh, you know, we've really been able, we've been lucky to um, get approval many times uh, through insurance to do the whole genome. So um, we not only look at the entire nuclear genome, that also does the mitochondrial genome too. So we can see if there's any problems there. <clears throat> the mito swab, you know, it's definitely not as accurate as something called a muscle biopsy or a skin biopsy. Um, but if it has severely low numbers and that's replicated, you know, many times that can um, suggest mitochondrial disease, which you might want to go on to do a muscle biopsy and confirm that. Whereas if it's just so-so, you know, sometimes it's a little bit low, it may indicate that it's more mitochondrial dysfunction. So, you know, it's, um, it's not, you know, uh, um, there's not kind of one size fits all as far as the workup, it's kind of complex, um, but, um, but all those pieces are definitely involved in depending on, you know, um, uh, the situation. Okay, so uh, tell me, do you prefer a levocarnitin? A carnitor or uh, L-carnitin when you have mildly reduced total carnitin and why? Yeah, um, so um, between, you mean like acetyl L-carnitine and L-carnitine, you know, I get the question a lot. Um, there's, uh, I, theoretically, there's no real difference between the two. Um, you know, they, they should be the same. They should act the same. Um, a lot of the studies on neuroprotection have been done with acetyl L-carnitine instead of um, 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 L-carnitine, but they should be the same. I tend to use L-carnitine because I can prescribe it. Um, but, um, you know, I think it's all what, uh, what um, your kiddo reacts to better. They should be interchangeable. Um, many times with carnitine, carnitine um, should be very helpful, um, but, um, but many times it can be a tough supplement. Um, and one of those reasons is that uh, carnitine um, is uh, important for transporting fatty acids. Um, and sometimes we know that uh, in kiddos with autism, the gut microflora, um, if it's not balanced, can have um, abnormalities in short chain uh, fatty acids, you know, such as propionic acid. And if you put carnitine in there, the flux of those fatty acids into the body can increase. So, um, so you have to be careful 
you know, when you use it, a lot of kids respond to it well, but some kids have um, some type of an atypical reaction to it. Um, and many times that can be because the gut needs to be kind of fixed first, or sometimes you have to go up slower. Okay. Is there any difference between levocarnitin or L-carnitin, or is it the same product? No, that's the same product. product. So yeah, and then there's the acetyl L-carnitine, which you know is a slightly different form, but should be metabolized the same way. Sometimes people you know tolerate one better than the other, so whatever works. Uh, I have also a question. Uh, if you, you don't have uh, these more specific tests that you said, the swap buccal tests, or we don't, I don't think we have it in our country. What um, are other tests that can um, direct you to, to treat mitochondrial disease? Yeah, so I usually start out with a panel of, of markers, which I kind of showed there, of, uh, of mitochondrial markers to um, look for signs of mitochondrial disease or dysfunction. Um, and uh, clearly, you know, um, sometimes you don't have the ability to do the, the, the other tests. Sometimes, you know, people don't want to. The next, you know, traditional test would be a skin or a muscle biopsy, you know. Um, so, uh, and sometimes parents just don't want to do it. Or sometimes, you know, you're not, not capable of doing it and, or, you, you know, it's not covered by insurance and such. Um, uh, of course, genetic testing can kind of guide you if there's a genetic disorder, although you only find that in about 25% of the cases. Um, sometimes if you're convinced that there's mitochondrial dysfunction, so, you know, I have a nice case I, I talk about, you know, with mitochondrial disease. Um, this little girl had mitochondrial disease, and it was clear because every time we did her lactates, you know, they were through the roof. So a lot of times, you know, if um, you can do these mitochondrial blood tests, and th they can be inaccurate, you know, notoriously lactates, you know, known for being elevated, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, just spuriously, uh, because the turner gets on too long and such. So then you can repeat it. So many times I'll repeat it if I want to be convinced that it's, uh, that it's real. And if it's real, you know, again, most of the mitochondrial supplements are, are pretty much benign. So you can kind of try them, you know, see if they work. If they don't work, you know, you move on to something else. Uh, one question from online, please. Um, do you have experience with L-carnosine in treating mitochondrial dysfunction? Yeah, L-carnosine, I, I don't know how much it, it affects the mitochondria. Um, it definitely has um, um, some um, good effects, you know, in core symptoms of autism. You know, Michael Chez, a while back, a long time back, did those studies. And uh, that was actually one of the first supplements I used to use. Um, um, but, uh, and then there's a new study that shows that it seems to improve sleep. So sometimes if there's nothing else that ha helps with sleep, I'll try, um, L-carnosine, um, but I'm not sure about its effect on the mitochondria. Thank you. Uh, one more question on, uh, from online. Uh, you mentioned high alanine and methionine as reflective of mitochondrial abnorm abnormality. What about low levels of those alanine and methionine? So uh, uh, I'm sorry if I misspoke. It's alanine and the alanine to lysine ratio. So high alanine itself. So um, when lactate gets broken down, it gets broken down into either pyruvate or alanine. So if alanine's high, it's another sign that might, there might be underlying lactic acidosis. And, um, and then um, Richard Kelly from the Kennedy Krieger Institute uh, was the one that, uh, that popularized the alanine to lysine ratio above 2.5 as another sign of lactic acidosis. Um, <clears throat> methionine um, definitely is important for methylation. And we do see that low, um, um, it, and it's uh, as a sign of mitochondrial dysfunction. I'm not so sure, but definitely it's important. Um, and if it's low, you know that that does point to a methylation defect, which needs to be addressed. Thank you. Ja bi zamolila za komentar. Kod mog sina koji ima 35 godina, piruvati su ispod normale, a laktati su isto tako niski. Yeah, um, you know, so some kiddos with mitochondrial dysfunction, we don't see any of these elevated markers. And uh, we do see sometimes the low pyruvate um, in particular. 
And so that could uh, signal that there is some type of um, metabolic disorder um, and uh, that, uh, that either, you know, pyruvate um, and lactate isn't being made, which is needed to actually, you know, fuel the mitochondria, um, or the mitochondria is using it up. So the reason we measure pyruvate and lactate is it's the kind of the last step before carbohydrates go into the mitochondria. So if the mitochondria isn't working, they're elevated because the mitochondria isn't using them up, right? But what we suspect is sometimes the, if the mitochondria is working too hard, we, we see these overactive mitochondria, they can be low because the mitochondria is using them too much and you need more of them. So although I don't, you know, can't point to any scientific evidence for that, it's something that uh, we've kind of suspected clinically. Yes. Dobar dan. Ja sam majka prevremeno rođenog deteta u petu mesecu. Imam pitanje, da li je moguće da je kisonik u inkubatoru uzdrukovao poremeće mitohondrija? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. You know, we were seeing that more and more that there's these prenatal factors, you know, that, uh, that program the mitochondria and then that this continues long term. So, um, you know, I can't say that specifically, but, you know, I wouldn't rule it out that uh, that or the stress, it may be the reason why the child was early, you know, if there was inflammation or other types of abnormalities that occurred at that time, that could maybe be something that uh, may have affected the mitochondria um, long term. Uh, imam pitanje vezano za ADHD i hiperaktivnost. Da li to može biti jedan od simptoma mitohondrijalne disfunkcije? I još jedno pitanje, uh, vidjela sam malo pre u sklopu terapije vezane za leukovorin da ide još i riboflavin i ubiquinon. Da li može ubiquinol i da li je to neka bitna razlika? Yeah, so um, it, it, we definitely see that in mitochondrial, you know, disorders. Of course, it wouldn't be my first thing as, you know, the, the number one sign, you know, because there's so many things that cause hyperactivity, but definitely we see that. Um, what Biquinol, um, you know, is the, um, is kind of the bioactive form of CoQ10. I always recommend it um, because you're going to get uh, more of a kind of five, ten time boost in the amount that you get compared to a Biquinone. Um, it's, and it's also my, more bioavailable. Um, it's uh, usually very well tolerated, so you know, I, I do like it. Helps with mitochondrial function. Um, also, if you have low cholesterol, so sometimes kids with autism have low cholesterol, CoQ10 is made from, um, from cholesterol, so it can cause a CoQ10 deficiency, so it can help there. There's some evidence that it also helps with sleep, um, rubiquinol. So I usually recommend ren rubiquinol I think, you know, it's one of those supplements that can be helpful, you know, um, and uh, it has kind of a low impact of side effects. So, you know, I, I would be, think that it's something to try. Okay, sorry. Um, is it better to check pyruvate and lactate from urine or from the blood? I'm sorry, what was, I, you, you, um, what from the urine or the blood? You kind of cut out. Uh, pyruvate and lactate. Oh, uh, so blood. Yeah. Blood. Okay. Yeah, urine. Urine. You know, we look at urine organic acids um, <clears throat> because the uh, the urine tends to concentrate certain organic acids. So if they're at high levels, they come up in the urine. But the urine isn't great at really making fine distinctions. And of course, you, you can imagine because you know sometimes we collect a lot of urine, sometimes we collect a little urine, sometimes it's overnight. You know, um, and the and the kidneys filter things too, so it kind of changes what's in the blood. So, um, so even though it, it's kind of a complementary test, the, the urine for measuring these things, um, I wouldn't say that it's kind of the, the, the most accurate test. So um, I wouldn't rely on it. Do you recommend acetyl L-carnitine ever? Um, sometimes, yeah. I think whatever, whichever form of carnitine seems to be uh, better tolerated you know, either the acetyl-L-carnitine or the, the, um, um, the uh, 
the L-carnitine. Um, they should be the same. They should be interchangeable. Uh, another question from online. Um, just wondering why the drug approval for these clearly effective medications takes so much time. What are the factors affecting the process? Heterogeneity of the disorder and problems of subtyping, big pharma funding resistance from inside medical community. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of the problems with these, um, these kind of um, uh, long used um, medications um, is, uh, you know, the major problem is really funding. You know, so in, there's there's no so unless you can get unless there's an absolute um, ability to get intellectual property rights, most pharma companies are not going to um, pursue these things because they're not going to make a lot of money on it. You know, they're businesses, and that's how businesses work, right? They want to make money, so you know, and I don't think that it's necessarily evil or anything. It's just you know the way that uh, people try and make profits. So. Um, so you know, there's there's many things that uh, can improve that. Is one to try and make novel compounds, you know, that can be patented, so you can attract you know um, attract uh, drug companies, or two get funding, you know, from you know other types of um, you know philanthropy groups or governments and such. But you know that's very tough to get too. So um, so uh, yeah, it's 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 definitely a problem because it definitely biases some of these very simple and safe treatments that we just don't have the evidence for right now. And we really need that, you know, that evidence um, to move forward. And, and it's not always so easy because, um, you know, uh, as you mentioned in the question, you know, autism is very uh, heterogeneous. So, you know, even if you test these compounds, it's not gonna be like one study and you know, it's going to be a home run. You know, you have to look at the nuances of things too, which takes money and time. So um, it's definitely problems that, you know, we need to wrestle with and we need to figure out because there's some things that are very much useful and could be very, you know, available that um, aren't getting approval, you know, and don't have the studies because of these uh, factors. Uh, hello, I have a question, man. Uh, do you have experience about uh, take uh, ubiquinol uh, some patient with epilepsy? Because I have a patient and um, the little child take ubiquino and different uh, uh, things, different vit vitamin. And after one month, uh, he had a lot of seizures, she, uh, a lot of attacks, she, much more worse. So maybe, but it's uh, dependent. Uh, you're recommended? To, yeah, I mean, it? you know, this sounds like a very complex case, you know, I mean, First, you know, if, if somebody has an adverse reaction to any type of supplement, you know, of course, it's important to look at the actual formulation of the supplement. You know, do they it has something in it that they might be allergic to, you know, that make make things worse, you know. So, you know, uh, many times it's not the supplement itself. And in fact, we see that in many drug reactions, all right, is we, we know that like 50% of just reactions to common drugs that we take are because of the additives, not because of the drug. So same thing with supplements, you know, you could try a uh, different formulation from a different company um, and such. And then there's the other side, epilepsy is, is very complicated, you know, that's why you really need to, you know, uh, you know, these hard cases need to be really looked at very closely. And, you know, sometimes we find that if the brain is working so poorly that, you know, an underlying brain that could have seizures doesn't have seizures, and then you improve the, the way the brain works, and then they start having seizures. Um, so um, I think, um, yeah, it, it's not, not a straightforward answer, unfortunately for you, but, uh, but the, these are very complex cases, yeah. Well, Dr. Fry, thank you so much. And yeah.